Wow, how about those singers? Amen. So anointed, yes. I thought Amy was going to preach my sermon. I was, uh, what a powerful word from the Lord. Um, and I tell you, true ministry happens when you bear your heart to people. If you want to be a witness to somebody, be honest with them. Be honest with them. Tell them who you used to be. And then let them see who you are now by the power of God. And then the Holy Spirit will do the rest, won't he? You believe that? Praise God. Well, about 45 minutes ago, maybe an hour, I was up in my office, and the Lord gave me this word for you. Uh, I don't tend to try to wait to last minute to get a sermon ready, but I do prepare. But sometimes he just arrests you and says, this is the way you need to go. So please don't judge this sermon by my preparation. Uh, just hear from the Lord today. Amen? Amen? Because I know he has something for us, and it's powerful. I didn't come to say something. I came with something to say. Amen? Amen? I know you've been sitting, so you can remain seated. I want to turn to Luke chapter 12 and look at a few passages there and just sort of share my heart with you. Amen. So many ministries in this church uh, celebrate recovery, met Friday night. Uh, I think we had a movie night, and there were 19 or 20 folks who participated in that and the fellowship of dinner and watching a movie together. And it's uh, so comforting as a pastor to know that your people are fellowshipping with one another. And they love one another because you're family. Now, you will have squabbles, and you will have disagreements, and you will have times of uh, feeling like you want to be bitter and unforgiving and hold a grudge. But I want to encourage you today. Just forgive. Because a year from now, if not six months from now, what you're upset about, you'll laugh about it. Because in the scheme of the kingdom of God, it is minute, isn't it? So I encourage you to forgive today and move forward in Christ. But I'm so glad you're here. If you're watching by internet, listening by podcast, we're glad to have you as well. I hope that you feel what we feel here today. And we are having a family service, and our kids are with us. If you're a visitor, we do have children's church, but it's, we do take one Sunday a month and we bring the kids up here because I want them to feel the power of God. I want them to know what it's like to have old school children's church sitting right here with you. Amen? And allow the Word of God to be sown into their heart. So Luke chapter 12, and I want to read the words of Christ from verse 21 starting, and it says this, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And verse 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. Now when you read that, if you're reading it in the King James, I want you to hear what the true text says. It actually says, Don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety about your life. What you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Amen. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Amen. How much more are you better than the fowls? Verse 25 again, he says, And which of you, with taking thought or being anxious, or having anxiety, can add to his stature one single inch to his height. If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why, take thought, why are you anxious? Why do you have anxiety for the rest? Now these are the words of Christ. He's asking you this. I'm not. Consider the lilies they grow. They toil not. They spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye 
of little faith. And seek ye not what you shall eat, nor what you shall drink, neither be doubtful in mind, or have anxieties in your mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. Verse 31. But rather seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. May the Lord add his blessing to the word. Thank you again for reading with me. Anxiety is an overwhelming concern or fear that leads to phobias. Anxiety, if not dealt with, is generally never stopped. It always gets worse. It always gets darker. And our doctors, of course, they're faced with the trouble of not understanding the spirit man. Because you have to be able to, and I believe that our bodies, just our mind, our brains, just like our heart, can have a dysfunction. But I also believe that there's spiritual attacks. I believe there's problems in the spirit realm that can be dealt with without medication. I believe that. Not against medication, but a lot of times I believe doctors are quick to prescribe medication when it's not needed. And all you need to do is deal with that thing in the spirit realm. And what happens is, it gives you a problem that you didn't have to begin with. And that's where discernment, strong discernment, as a gift of the spirit, really comes into effect in your life. Amen? Because there are many, including myself, who have battled and struggled with anxiety. There are 11-year-old kids who struggle with anxiety. I didn't know what anxiety was till I was about 19. But we live in a world that is uh, so uh, putting so much pressure on people and children, especially in our country. We have so much, yet we're the most anxious country in the world. And I believe it's because we have too much. You see, because if you lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth, (laughs) you're not seeking the kingdom of God. And any time that your mind is put on yourself, you're not thinking about anybody else. And that's a plan of the devil. He wants you to be so overly anxious that you think about nothing but your own well-being and your own comfort. We've all been there. And that's his plan from the very beginning. That's That's why he told Adam and Eve, you'll have the knowledge of God. You will be like God. And he was making it all about Adam and Eve. And nothing had to do with Almighty God. And that's still his plan today. In fact, the Bible says in John 10.10 that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But aren't you glad that Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, and with thanksgiving make your requests known unto God. Then the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Have you ever had peace in a situation where you should have had doubt and unbelief and dread and terror and fear, but you felt this overwhelming presence come upon you? Well, let me remind you what that is. That's the peace of God that passes all understanding. I still believe the words of Isaiah when he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, it shall not burn you, nor shall the flame kindle against you. I still believe what he said in Isaiah 41 and 10 when he said, fear thou not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee and uphold thee with my righteous right hand hand. I still believe what Jesus said in John 14 and 27 when he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I still ring the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 verse 1 when he says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I still believe Isaiah 26 and 3 when he says thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusts in thee. I still believe the words of the psalmist in Psalm 27 and 1 when he says the Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? What do I have to be afraid of? I still believe God's word today and I believe what Jesus said when he said be anxious for nothing. Not even the clothes that you put on your back. Not even trying to find a place to live because he's already worked it out. He's already provided a way. And if he will so clothe the grass of the field which was not even as beautiful as Solomon and all of his glory what shall he do for the people of God today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think about Obadiah. You know who Obadiah is? And the Old Testament is the shortest book of the Old Covenant. But it's packed with power. It's a minor prophet. It's not minor in message. It's minor in verbiage. But Obadiah prophesied to two nations, Edom and Israel. Edom were the descendants, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Israel, of course, were the descendants of Jacob. Now Israel was going through a lot of anxiety because the judgment of God was coming upon them. The temple was being destroyed. The Babylonian invaders had come in to destroy the land, take captive the people of God. Men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Men like Daniel. And he left the old men like Jeremiah back in Jerusalem to see that thing burn. So there was a lot of anxiety there. But he prophesies, Obadiah prophesies to Edom. And the reason he prophesies to Edom is because God is letting Edom know, my people are being judged, but they will be restored one day. As for you, Edom, you will be judged eternally. Why? Well, Edomites, when Moses was taking the Israelites through the wilderness journey, they come to Edom. And they say, let us pass through here that we can get to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, no, you can't pass through our land. And God never forgot about that. In fact, he was, it was so fresh in the mind of God that he tells Obadiah, prophesy to these people and tell them what's going to happen. And he sure did. And when Babylon came into Jerusalem to ransack the temple and take the temple artifacts, the neighboring Edom did nothing. They didn't do anything to help their brother, Jacob, Israel. And God says, because of this, you will be judged. Now, I want you to think about something. We always talk about the sins of the flesh, fornication, adultery, lust, cheating, stealing. We talk about the sins of the spirit unforgiveness and bitterness, malice, jealousy. But how about the sin of doing nothing? We don't really talk about that, do we? Leave it up to somebody else. Put it on somebody else's plate. Cast it to the side. Well, that's what the priest did in Luke chapter 10 when he walked by a poor beggar, sick and needing a touch from God. Oh, he was religious. Oh, he attended church. He might have preached a sermon or two. He probably had the first five books of the law memorized. But when he saw this man hurting, he didn't lift a finger to hurt him, but he didn't lift a finger to help him either. The sin of doing nothing. Then this good Samaritan man walks by him, a man that shouldn't even be in covenant with God, walks by this poor sick beggar, and the Bible says that he touched the man, ministered to the man, brought oil and wine to heal his wounds. That's a sign and a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. We are called as the people of God not to stand idly by and do nothing in this country, in this community. Listen to me today, because there is the sin of doing nothing. I want you to think about that because that ties into our text. Because Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God. Then all these things will be added unto you. How can you pray for somebody else if you're constantly thinking about your own life? How can you pray for the lost when you're so concerned about your own self being saved? 
And the devil puts this anxiety upon your life that hinders you from fulfilling the purpose and the call of God that he has placed in your life. I ask you that. How? And the answer is you cannot. And it puts you exactly where Edom was. You see, Edom being the descendants of Esau, there's a significance there. When you think about Esau and Jacob, these brothers, these twins, born of Isaac and Rebekah, the grandsons of Abraham, when Esau came out of the womb, he was already a man's man. He probably had a gun on his back and a cigar hanging out of his mouth. And then Jacob's right behind him, grabbing that heel. Esau was a picture of the flesh man. Jacob is a picture of the spirit man. God chose Jacob. He hated Esau. Now, Esau was a hunter. He was his papa's boy. He knew how to kill deer, big game. He knew how to shoot. He was rugged. He was a man's man. A man of the flesh. So much so that he traded his birthright for something to eat. How did he do that? Well, he did that by the con artist, Jacob. Jacob was a long-haired, rock-and-roll, cunning kind of dude. He was a mama's boy. You see, Rebecca had taken to Jacob. And he says, okay. She said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to not only deceive your brother, but I want you to deceive your father. What's the significance there? I want you to think about your life for a moment. Because you have a spirit man, if you are saved and you trust in Jesus, and you've been born again, you, have, you are a spirit man first. Spirit, soul, body. When you're born, your body, soul, spirit. When you get saved and born again, set apart, sanctified by the hand of God, you are spirit, soul, and body. But so many Christians today, they're living by their bodies and not their spirits. They're living by Esau's standard of living and not Jacob's standard of living. You see, Jacob was the kind of man, oh yeah, he was rebellious, he was cunning, he was crafty, but he was also a seeker after God. In fact, an angel wrestled with him so strongly that it put his hip out of joint, and he never walked the same again. And the reason that happened is because he says, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. He was a man after God. And God chose Jacob. But you see, the problem, ladies and gentlemen, anxiety, worry, stress, it all comes from the flesh man, from Esau. The sin of doing nothing. So now, you've got your mind on your life, you're four and no more. And you're not seeking the kingdom of God. Here sits a man and a woman who have come all the way from Georgia to pastor and launch a church, United Church in Winston-Salem. And they're doing it completely by faith. Got a place to live yet? Nope. But they're starting next week. By faith. Now, if they were living by Esau's standards and by the flesh man, oh, they'd be overly anxious, worried, concerned. How is this going to work out? But he's a perfect example of seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And I can assure you that everything will be added unto him. He has no worries or anxieties that control their lives because they trust God. Can I remind you, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You believe that? Shout yes. yes. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel him today. This anxious spirit that you're battling, you don't have to battle it anymore. Did you hear what I said to you? You just don't have to battle it anymore. You say, well, how? Well, one of two ways. If it's spiritual, we can take care of that pretty easy. If it's physical, we can take care of that pretty easy. 
because I still believe in the hand of God that heals his people. I'm sure Paul got anxious. I'm sure Peter got anxious at times. In fact, sitting in a Roman jail cell, getting ready to lose his head, the Bible says he was up walking around, pacing the floor, uh, beating his fists against the jail wall, screaming, let me out, what am I going to do? Oh wait, that's not what he was doing. The Bible says that he was sawing logs, <laughs> snoozing between two Roman guards, knowing he was getting ready to lose his life. Now, I want to tell you something. To me, that is true, biblical, God-fearing, God-seeking kind of faith. I'm so tired of hearing slick-haired, shiny-shoe preachers telling me that if I have faith, I will have no problems, I will have no worries, and no cares, and always have a ton of money. If, you, if your preacher on TV is telling you that, turn him off, and let me tell you what to do. Go to Daniel chapter 3, and I want you to read about three Hebrew boys that stood before for a rebellious king and they said listen to me old king I know you've turned the fire up seven times hotter and it's going to be hot in there but my God the God of Israel shall deliver me but if he doesn't he's still good and he's still God when you can get to that place where you can believe God that even if you take your last breath on this blue marble planet God has you in his hand and if God be for you who in the world can be against you, a son and a daughter of God. That's a good prescription for anxiety right there. That's right. When you can stand before the people of this world and say, take my life. Paul did that many times. And you know how he could do it? He says, you can't kill a dead man. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I would rather go be with the Lord, but it's expedient for me that I stay with you. And that might be the case in your life. It may be more important for God to keep you on this earth to do the work of the ministry, not to make more money, not to seek after the things of this world, but to make sure you have fulfilled the purpose and call of God upon your life. Pastor James Amoko was with us Wednesday night. If you wasn't here, I'm sorry. He gave us a powerful word for this church. He said, we're going to the next level. That's right. Not only as a church, but as individuals. Going to the next level. Well, how do you do that? Well, by faith. You take a step and you take the territory that he's given you. They're gonna take Winston-Salem for God. You believe that? Yeah. I Listen to me. I pray that the, what he's going to do, he's going to set that place up as a training center, and then he's going to relaunch this thing, which is a wonderful vision. And when he does, I pray, God hear me today. I pray that he has 200 people on that first day. I know you're believing God for that, and so am I. And I pray it's 200 people who are lost, dying, hurting, sinful, and dark, and twisted, so that the light of the gospel can change their lives. Amen. Good God, I feel him today. Luke 21. The best way to cure anxiety, worry, and fear, I don't even like saying that. Best way to do it is to encourage somebody else. I tell people when they're anxious, pray for somebody else that's anxious. Find somebody. They're out there. They're in this church. Amen? Amen? But the best way to defeat it is encourage somebody else yes, and never, ever quit. Amen. Amen. If you've got a fear, face that thing. Yes. Amen? Amen? Because once you take that step of faith, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you by experience, there was a time, and I don't speak to this often, there was a time in my life where I, and I never even told my wife, I, I didn't tell anybody, there was a time in my life when I was in the ministry where I got so anxious before getting in this pulpit, it almost paralyzed me. And it was out of nowhere. I'd never felt that way before. Paralyzed me. But every time, feeling like I was overwhelmed and going to pass out, and this was the end, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm having a heart attack, my foot would step on that stage. 
and the power of God would touch my life. And I never thought about it again until the next time I had to walk up on that stage. But I took a step and got on that stage and the power, that's how you learn to overcome this thing. Now, if that thought comes, all I've got to do is say, Lord, that's in the past. I don't need it and I don't want it. Because if I walk up here and take my last breath, this is the place I want to be. Luke 21. I love this. This is pretty good for a little hour sermon I just got an hour ago. With. Luke 21. Look at verse 33. Jesus talking about the last days. We're doing Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights. And I'm believing God for big things. And this community in this county to see the power of God transform lives. Amen. But let me tell you what it's going to take for that to be successful. Steve and Brenda have followed the leading of the Spirit of God. They have set up this Celebrate Recovery for Friday night. We've got volunteers that are helping. But one thing I can tell you is that it's going to be very little chance that somebody's just going to come walking in here. You have to do something. There's a jail in Stokes County full of men and women on their court dates who are battling addiction. Why don't we go to the jail? Why don't we go pass out some information? Why don't we have time? Make time. Take a day off. You see, when we get anxious, we feel like we need a vacation. Maybe you need to do ministry. Oh, well, yeah. Seek first the kingdom of God, not the beach in Hawaii, not the Bahamas. Been there, blech. You're just as miserable when you get there as you are here, I promise you. All right. The sin of doing nothing. I want you to think about that. Luke 21, I'm going to close here. Verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's enough right there, isn't it? And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfighting. That's a big word, isn't it? Now, the Greek word is actually rendered a word that means confusion, anxiety. In fact, the root word of that is methe which is where we get our word methamphetamine from. Notice what he says. And drunkenness. Again, the root word is methe. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't be overly anxious in the last days and dealing with it with alcohol, drugs, substance abuse, and the cares of this life. The cares of this life. What are you going to do? You've lost your job. What are you going to do? The company is crashing. What are you going to do? You get the pink slip. What are you going to do? You get a diagnosis from the doctor that says this is the end, six months. What are you going to do? You hear a tragedy in your family. The, the devil has wiggled his way in there and he's brought devastation. What are you going to do? The cares of this life. You know, I also believe that the cares of life go far beyond tragedy. How about seeking after the highest office, the best parking spot, the best retirement, the best pay? The American dream. How about that? How about those cares of life? So that that day, that's the day of the Lord, come upon you unaware. 
Jesus said in the last days it will be like the days of Noah when people are marrying and given in marriage. In other words, they'll be going about their daily lives, living the American dream. And before you know it, Jesus has returned. Did y'all see my page flip? That's strange. All right. Verse 35. For as a snare shall it come upon all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Think about it. Mass confusion. I still believe in a rapture. And when it happens, can you imagine the hysteria? The chaos? Can you imagine Fox News and CNN? Can you imagine the, the planes that crash because the godly pilots have been resurrected out of that thing? Can you imagine the, the news cameras standing at the graveyards all across this world saying, what has happened? Because you see, people of the world don't understand this stuff. It's foolishness to them. And then when it happens, they'll try to explain it away. And that's when God raises up 144,000 flaming Jewish evangelists that will spread the gospel throughout this earth. Amen. But think about the mass chaos. Think about the mass death that will take place. People being taken out of cars, airplanes. Think about that. Policemen taking out of their cars. The mass chaos in communities when there's no law and order because nobody knows what's going on. Now, we had riots a few years ago right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. You remember that? In Dallas, Louisiana. Think about the chaos that was taking place with all that because the law was gone because of protests. What were they doing? They were looting, destroying property, defaming personal property, stealing. Now, think about that on a mass scale, which would be even worse when Jesus returns and the rapture happens. Think about that. Don't let that day come upon you unaware. Number one, be ready by knowing Jesus Christ, surrendering your life to Christ. And number two, let me tell you, you ready? For as a snare shall come upon the whole earth, verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape, shout escape, all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch and pray. Have a commitment to the Lord. Seek his face. Amen. Be a person of prayer, a man, a woman of prayer who, who talks to God and communes with him. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Be that person that is in constant communion with God, not seeking after your own well-being. I know you're struggling with anxiety and, and fears and, and certain worries, but Jesus said, don't worry about anything. Amen. My good God. Take no thought. All right. Turn to Jeremiah. I'm closing with this, I promise. This just came to my heart. I want to share it with you. I promise, I'm done. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer in keeping you here very long. Jeremiah 17. I was preaching one night. My daughter, I said, I'm closing. My daughter looked at my wife and says, what does that mean? My wife said, not a thing at all. Amen. <laughs> Jeremiah 17. Look at verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man. Cursed is the man that trusts in Esau, the way of the flesh. Because your flesh says quit. Your flesh says, I'm going to leave the church. Your flesh says, I'm going to quit doing that ministry. Your flesh says, I just need a break. Your flesh says, oh, I'll just burn out. But your spirit man says, I've got to keep going. Your spirit man says, I cannot quit. Your spirit man says, I shall move forward and claim territory. Amen. But curses is the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. When you make flesh, listen to me, when you make flesh your arm, when you trust in yourself and your own prideful abilities, you will depart from the Lord. Verse 6. 
for he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes but shall inhabit the not see when good comes think about that anxiety worry fear all that brings is negativity into your life you hate everything and everybody you're always seeing the negative in people don't you can you just i just how do you feel about people like that let me put it that way It drags everybody down, doesn't it? I've been there. You've been there, too. But some of you need to catch yourself now and say, you know what? Huh? Maybe the reason I feel the way I do is because I've allowed the arm of the flesh to dictate my life. Just something to think about. Verse 6. Verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Verse 8, I want you to get this. I want you to read this every day this week. Verse 8. For he shall, and where it says he put I, for I shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out my roots by the river and shall not see when heath or heat comes, but my leaf shall be green. <laughs> Even in the parts, dry seasons of life, your leaf shall be green. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season, and his leaf shall not wither. And whatever he does, it shall prosper. Amen. You believe that? Shout amen. amen. Let me finish. And shall not see when he come. I'll tell you, I... This is this Bible here. This is my, I got this in 1998 when I first started preaching. And this print, buddy, is tough. But I love this Bible. I wouldn't take a million dollars for this thing. Can't see when he comes. But my leaf shall be green and shall not be careful. Shout careful. Shall not be anxious. In the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. My good God, that's powerful, isn't it? Even in the dry seasons of your life, with worry and despair and depression, when you feel like you have no hope, in dry seasons, you can still bear fruit. Your leaf shall be green, and you do not have to be anxious. If you believe it, shout yes. Stand to your feet all over this building. If you're watching by internet, listening by podcast, I want to relieve you from anxiety today. In fact, everybody just stretch your hands toward that camera. Father, in the name of Jesus, whoever's watching, I just bind and rebuke that spirit of anxiety. You haven't given them a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound, pure, wholesome mind. And you will keep them in perfect peace because their mind will stay upon you. Simply confess your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that God raised him from the dead. And you, sir, you, ma'am, shall be saved today in Jesus name God bless you thank you for watching and listening